Welcome to the Business of Government Hour TV, a video companion to our flagship radio program. I'm Michael Keegan, your host. Each week, government executives or thought leaders join me for an informative, insightful, and in-depth conversation on improving government effectiveness. These individuals are truly changing the way government does business. What is the mission of the U.S. Department of the Interior's Office of Wildland Fire? And how is it working to continually improve wildland fire suppression? I'll explore these questions and so much more with our very special guest, Brian Rice, Director of the Office of Wildland Fire at the U.S. Department of the Interior. Also joining me from IBM is Lisa Yarborough. Take a look, take a listen, download the entire interview on iTunes or at businessofgovernment.org. So, Brian, um, it would be good to help our listeners understand better what is uh, wildland fire and what role fire plays in natural resource land management. Um, some fires, as when I was doing some research for this, it needs, they need to be suppressed and sometimes they don't. So could you describe that decision space for whether to fight a fire or not? Fire is very important. Fire is an incredibly important part of the ecosystem. If you look at our landscape across this country, whether it's rangeland or forested land, woodlands, which is that in-between types of forested land, they are all uh, have some nexus to fire. Even, even farmers you see in the Midwest, they burn their stubble fields after the harvest, right, to, to cycle nutrients. There's, and so fire has this incredible, incredible place in the landscape. There's, there's stands of different types of pine species that need fire. The heat actually releases the seeds from the cones. So if you look at a, a very commonly known species, the ponderosa pine, Ponderosa pine has an extremely thick bark. It's in an ecosystem that needs fire. It cleans out the underbrush. It cleans out the lower, smaller vegetation and allows the, the tree to grow healthier and stronger, as well as repopulate, germinate seeds from the, the cones that are coming down. So there's this incredible need for fire in the landscape. How do we get to that place where, where we actually say, this fire we actually need to address? And... I would say in the federal space, every fire has some type of response. Mm -hmm. Every fire has some type of response. The response may be just to watch and monitor to ensure that the fire is not threatening infrastructure, public, uh, any other type of safety that goes with it. But ultimately, there's a decision that's made to be more aggressive or to be monitoring. Brian, before we delve into specific initiatives, uh, perhaps you could provide us with a, a brief overview of the history and mission of the Department of the Interior's Office of Wildland Fire. So the, the Office of Wildland Fire is a product of many things that have happened here over the last several decades, uh, most namely Late 1980s, most people remember Yellowstone when it burned. Huge fire within the West, consumed hundreds of thousands of acres within Yellowstone National Park. Fast forward five or six years later, and um, the South Canyon fire in Colorado, Storm King Mountain, right outside of Glenwood Springs, uh, large fire fatalities occurred at that fire. Um, a, a large number of fatalities, and several other large fires, whether it was prescribed fires that escaped or other types of things that happened, really drove uh, fire policy at a national level. It really put fire in the headlines in front of everybody in, in a very grand kind of way. And in the Department of the Interior, there's four bureaus that manage land. There's roughly 500 million acres of land that they're managing. Uh, National Park Service, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Fish and Wildlife Service, Bureau of Land Management. So at the time, decision was made to stand up a singular office to manage the budget, to set the policy concurrently and uh, through consensus with the bureaus to actually have a cohesive and cogent fire uh, management organization. So the office has been in place for roughly two decades, early 2000s, so uh, formally 2002. And the mission is really to focus on uh, a large-scale budget 
that that supports all fire operations, all uh, other land management activities in connection with their programs, but across the country within the Department of the Interior. Mm-hmm. You know, saying that obviously leads to some challenges, uh, you know, coordination and, and collaboration. But what would you say are your top, say, three challenges that you face, and how have you sought to address those challenges? So I would say the the three challenges really show up in, in three places, right? I would say the first place is um, the workforce, uh, second place is the the technical side of things, and by that I mean we we have uh, an infrastructure, we have an IT infrastructure, information technology infrastructure that supports wildland fire. And then the third part of it is dealing with uh, our external stakeholders. So in terms of dealing with the the workforce side of it, to to go into this a little bit further, historically in the fire program, every person that worked in fire historically worked in a natural resource program. Mm -hmm. So if you go back 100 years ago, the foresters who were, or the forest rangers, or the rangeland managers, or the wildlife biologists, or all the the natural resource managers, when there was a fire that happened, those were the folks who were involved in fire. Now today, we have a much different dynamic. We have less people who are coming up through those different disciplines. And so we're relying on other uh, disciplines to support those fire functions. And that's not to say we didn't have the finance and accountants and supply managers and all the other functions that went with it, but it's a different dynamic with the workforce now. So we're seeing that. We can talk a little more about that. In terms of our external stakeholders, the way the public perceives fire, the way the public uh, has grown around fire, the way we've seen urbanization across the country really creates a different dynamic. There's there's a, a nostalgic uh, view that there's a cabin in the woods and that's where we're all going to go have a, a great place to, to recreate and and to relax. And, and what we find is many of those places are built in very fire-prone areas, very fire-prone zones. And so uh, managing how we have that information go out to the public. And then the third piece, and we'll, we'll get into this a little later, I, I hope, is talking about the technology and what's actually behind wildland fire and what we, what we have, what we need, and how we're trying to get there. I think that's probably a good a good place to wow. dive into. Along with the challenges you've encountered leading such a critical mission uh, support portfolio can be fraught with unanticipated or unexpected surprises that include the loss of life, limb, or property. To that end, Brian, what has surprised you the most since taking on your current role? I will say the one single largest surprise that I've had in in this position since I since I took it since I stepped into it was the complexity of of how everything comes together 500 million acres of federal land hundreds of millions of acres of private land state land counties other land jurisdictions uh hundreds of volunteer and rural fire departments, 567 federally recognized tribes, 50 state governments, along with some territories. And how do you bring that all together in a way that makes sense where we have interoperability that's working across boundaries? Because remember, fire doesn't stop at a state boundary and it doesn't stop at a road, you know, because it's a a county road versus a federal road versus a state road. So the complexity that goes with it has been just incredible. And so that comes back to how do we address it? And it really comes down to communication and, and those soft skills that are so important on, on how we're working with our partners as well as our federal sister agencies to, to work through all the issues. So with all these decision support systems, it seems that um, the the community would be primed to start leveraging some of the cognitive capabilities that are coming out today uh, by industry. What are the plans for OWF or the, the community to start taking advantage of these cognitive capabilities that essentially learn over time in these decision support systems? That is a great question, and that is our is probably one of our bigger challenges at the moment. I think that I think we're primed to do a lot of that work at the moment. Um, this comes back to working with people and building consensus. Um, 
understanding what those what those uh, tools are and how they can actually add value to the overall to the overall process, I think, is really important. I think we, uh, the the piece I would add to it is a, a lot of times um, the federal federal and state and tribal firefighting forces are compared to some of the the military forces in ways you know the special forces and those pieces that go with it. I think it's important to note what we do on a shoestring budget. The, to put a war fighter in the field has a certain cost to it. To put a wildland firefighter in the field has a certain cost to it, and usually, the it's a fraction of the other. And so it's it's really it's a it's an interesting place where we do we do incredible work. The the staff that's in all of those bureaus does amazing work for the for the dollars that they have to actually. Do it. So Brian, you know earlier you described your vision for uh, your office. Um, I'd like to talk about what are some of your near-term objectives and say over the next two years and maybe within the next five, what do you really want to focus on? Well, there's a couple of things that I think are really important. I mean, overall, I want to see the uh, the fire program of the future. We have an incredible amount of people that are, are going to be entering the workforce. When we look at the millennials, the the Gen Z and, and everybody that's coming in, we, we have a huge opportunity to really shape the sort of the, the catchers met for all those folks that are coming in. And so I think that's something that's ingrained in everything that we're doing and talking about. So how are we managing communication? How are we ensuring that um, mobility needs in, in terms of uh, geographic mobility across the country is being addressed. But uh, in terms of the program itself, I think there's a couple of places where there's some really um, good opportunities really fast that, that we can be working on. And one is better integration of the use of unmanned aerial systems or, or drones, as some people refer to them. And part of that is uh, hobby drone operators, folks that have a quadcopter or a, a small fixed wing uh, UAS Everybody has one. Everybody's kids have them. They're they're everywhere, and and so that's and that's great. There's there's opportunity in many ways of, of fixing uh, infrared cameras, video cameras, uh, developing better digital elevation models. All the pieces that come with that. I think there's huge opportunity. I also think that there's uh, huge opportunity leveraging drone or UAS assets um, in communications as well. So quite often. The fire community uh, relies on line of sight communication tools. Well, if you raise something up three or four hundred feet, maybe six hundred feet, all of a sudden that communication web and that network just grows immensely. And I think there's a, another part of it, and this one um, is really important to me, and that's uh, focusing on location of our people and where they are on incidents and ensuring their safety. Remember, my number one priority is firefighter safety and ensuring that if people are inserted into risky situations, how do we mitigate that? Um, the, we have a, a, a secretary right now who, who came from the, the special forces and and incredibly uh, visionary in many ways. And, and fortunately, everybody is is connecting on how how we engage the use of UAS assets. But then in terms of where our people are, it's it's with a, a transponder or a chip, you know, and it's different ways of doing that, but actually having real time information of crew X is in certain location, crew Y's in another location, and being able to make those real-time decisions, as opposed to historically, it was based on a cycle. As data was gathered uh, throughout the night, numbers were crunched, morning briefing, everybody was sent out on their assignments. But as we know, weather changes, mm -hmm. other external factors change. So how do we get there? So I think Real that, time. yeah, ab absolutely. And and with the development of technology and going back to that example of the, the firefighter who had the cell phone taking a picture, I mean, that that was it right there. And that was, that was a decade ago that that happened. And so, you know, we need to be looking at how we can do things quicker and faster. Um, high speed, low drag is the, is the term that I like to use quite often. Um, and then the other thing that goes with it, uh, especially with the UAS components, is talking about um, how do we integrate the data that goes into where fire locations are. So one of the campaigns we had earlier last year was, uh, if you fly, we can't. And this year, it's nowhere to fly. 
And that is uh, whether it's using geofencing capabilities or other types of, of technology and data sharing. If you have a boundary of a fire, we can project that because a, a TFR is created, a, a um, temporary no fly re- or temporary flight restriction area, and so if a uh, hobby drone operator is is operating a, a quadcopter or a UAS in those areas, it stops all operations, all aviation operations. So those air tankers, the helicopters, all those things go on the ground because all it takes is one of those with a, a mid air strike, and it you know we can cause serious accident or fatality. So definitely looking on that. Thank you for joining me on this edition of the Business of Government Hour TV. Please subscribe on YouTube at Business of Government and on iTunes at the Business of Government Radio Hour. Until next time, it's businessofgovernment.org.